Hello and welcome to the podcast that takes you on a deep dive to discover the remarkable archaeological finds and clues to history which lie far below the surface of the seas. And it's not just shipwrecks or objects. In today's episode, we'll be discovering a bit more about the incredible ancient people who took to the seas, the Phoenicians. I think they really were the pioneers. They were the people, as I say, by reaching the Straits of Gibraltar and going out through them, they had really opened up the entire Mediterranean. I'm Bethany Hughes, and this is the Dive and Dig podcast. Welcome to Lucy Blue. Hello, Lucy. Hello, Bethany. So we've got some real treats in today's podcast, I reckon. Yep, we absolutely do. Um, today we're going to take a journey all across the length of the Mediterranean from Malta to the coast of Lebanon. Uh, we're going also to talk to Dr Timmy Gambin from the University of Malta, who's been excavating a Phoenician ship off the coast of Malta in, you won't believe it, in 110 metres of water. And the reason that we're taking this exciting journey from Malta to the Lebanon is because Timmy's shipwreck is Phoenician and the Phoenician heartland was the Lebanese coastland. And so through this journey, we're going to actually learn a bit more about Phoenician trading, about the nature of the cargoes of Phoenician trade and exchange. They are incredible, the Phoenicians, because they're quite enigmatic and mysterious. But they stitch together the Mediterranean from the far east to the far west and beyond. And they're not just traders. We talk about them as if they're just kind of, you know, the sort of Amazon prime of antiquity. But they're really nourishing and developing the, the civilizations and cultures that they're in contact with. No, absolutely. They were incredible seafarers and traders. Um, But I'm no expert in the Phoenicians. So we're going to hear now from Professor David Abulafia from the University of Cambridge. He's a professor in Mediterranean history, and he's going to tell us more about the history of the Phoenicians. Most uh, discussions of the Phoenicians really get going, let's say, around 900 BC, and assume that the foundation of Phoenician colonies around the Mediterranean and beyond really is much more a phenomenon of the 9th, 8th centuries BC. The understanding that basically it is the inhabitants of the towns along the coast of what is now Lebanon, um, and with Tyre and Sidon, Tyre being thought of as somehow the sort of daughter city of Sidon, which then becomes actually itself the mother city of other places like Carthage. Um, so a group of cities, very often on islands like Tyre and Arwad, actually on islands offshore, which is a great characteristic of the Phoenicians, even when they expand across the sea. This idea that the whole of the Mediterranean was being sort of opened up through connectivity, through seafaring and maritime exchange is, you know, it sort of really focuses one's mind on, on the scale, I guess, of, of, of connectivity and, and, and trade um, in a way, perhaps. I mean, having studied the Bronze Age or the late Bronze Age myself, I mean, I could see that from an Eastern Mediterranean perspective. But now, you know, moving into the Iron Age, we've got much more connectivity and trade and largely pushed through on on boats, um, through seafaring. No, I, I agree very much with that, because it's only really with the Phoenicians, Greeks and Etruscans that the whole Mediterranean becomes an integrated trading space. And if you go back to the Bronze Age, as you will know better than I, of course, we are looking to a very large extent at a concentration of activity in the eastern Mediterranean with Mycenaeans sort of filtering through to Italy and Mycenaean goods occasionally filtering through to Spain, Sardinian goods, very interestingly, turning up all over the place. But, but that is not like the picture which the Phoenicians created, because I think they really were the pioneers. They were the people, as I say, by reaching the Straits of Gibraltar and going out through them, they had really opened up the entire Mediterranean. And then also, of course, creating settlements along the coast of North Africa, uh, off western Sicily, Motia, and so on. Um, That whole network, which comes into being, quite unlike anything that had ever existed, Lucy, in terms of hard evidence, how how much do we know actually about the Phoenicians' ports of trade? 
Well, I mean, this is where Anna Frost, who was a pioneer diver and maritime archaeologist, um, worked extensively in the on, along the Lebanese coastline. And this was really the heart of some of the earliest discoveries of those interfaces, in effect, of trade and exchange, ports and harbours. And Honor was a, was absolutely... In fact, she inspired me for my own research into looking into harbours of these periods, not just from the Phoenician era, but also from earlier times. The Levantine seaboard, but in, in particular uh, Lebanon, is where we find some of the earliest harbour sites. And this is where Honor focused a lot of her research. She was really interested in discovering what these harbour sites look like and also what they could tell us about trade and exchange. Just thinking about the origins of these places. So you have natural harbours... How quickly do those become kind of proto-harbours that communities are are developing? So, I mean, in effect, people sought shelter. They needed to, you know, keep their boats safe. And so they would would, moor in lee of a a headland or something like that. But over time, they recognised that if you adapted the coastline a little bit, then you could actually reinforce that shelter. And so this is where this term proto-harbour comes in. It's sort of pre-harbour. But then over time, obviously, the the technology became more sophisticated. They were able to start constructing uh, keys and moles and things actually on the seabed um, and then obviously reinforce shelter but also build harbours in places where which were essentially exposed to prevailing winds. So we see this, this sort of increase of technology over time and therefore that means that the size of harbours can expand and the nature of harbour change, harbours change over time. When I think about them, for, yeah, actually, from the Bronze Age, kind of right the way through to late antiquity, I always imagine them to be really hyper buzzing places. Obviously, exchanges of goods, but also of ideas, and and for there to be many languages spoken. Is that a slight fantasy in my head, or do you think that's what was actually going on? No, 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 no. Even from the Bronze Age, as you say, we know that there was that they were amazing sort of melting pots in a way of lots of different traders and peoples and languages, and we see that through the scripts that are found in some of the early Bronze Age harbours. But over time, we can see this. I mean, basically, harbours were points of connectivity, as you say. They're about people and trade, and and ideas as well. Ideas are really important, and you can imagine this hu- you know, hustle and bustle, as it were. But they're also, they they had many different functions. So we're thinking of goods of trade coming in, but there were also areas where people would be fishing, you know, landing their catches. And obviously, over time, they evolved to also secure naval um, navies and naval vessels. So the harbours took on many roles, and it depending on where they were located, um, there was a need to have expand them in different ways. You know, Onofos was a real pioneer of, of harbour archaeology, it's become to known, and she did a lot of work in, on the Levantine coast. Um, and she investigated harbours that spanned, you know, millennia, as you've indicated. And, and one of her great friends and colleagues, Dr Claude Sahal, has worked on this incredible site, the site of Sidon, which lies to the south of Beirut along the coast of Lebanon. And she's here to talk to us now. I think what made uh, Sidon such an important city is really uh, the naturally protected harbour. That is for sure. So it had this geological reef uh, which joined with this island, which is the Zire Island. And and it's certainly a unique feature uh, of the Sidonian coastline. And it enclosed a body of water uh, sheltered from the prevailing winds, of course, and divided into an inner and an outer harbour. So the outer harbour was this island of Zire. And I think Honor uh, was the, uh, the first one to identify it as Sidon's offshore anchorage. And, um, and in the 7th century BC, this island is called Sidon, in the, in the Assyrian annals, Sidon the, in the midst of the sea. So this was this, this, it was still Sidon, but this was this offshore anchorage. And Honor did a lot of work uh, on this island. First she dived and Honor never, never worked only on the water. She always took into consideration the coast 
and the that and uh, it was always the deep waters and the shore. She had such insight at a, a period when people really weren't connecting these different approaches, and they weren't thinking about the sort of complexity of, uh, and and the connectedness of the land and the sea and how all these things work together. Basically, she really had quite an amazing view of putting archaeology in situ. She always taught me to look at the big picture. I have to say, uh, she used to come regularly to visit me, and she uh, she she always had you know the the right word. She, not that she wasn't interested in the archaeology. On the contrary, she came to see every every detail. But it was always about the big picture. This is what Anna had to say about ports. This is a reading from Anna Frost's book, aptly entitled Under the Mediterranean, that she published in 1963. It's amazing to think that she had such insight nearly 60 years ago. Tyre and Sidon were not the first ports I saw through a mask, but as I've said, they were the first to interest me. The marvellous associations of their names might seem reason enough, but in addition, careful and underestimated research made them intelligible. She really had an amazing insight into understanding this connection between land and sea and how changing landscapes really impacted on our interpretations of archaeological sites. And in fact, when Claude was working in Sidon, when she first started working there, which was more than 20 years ago, she encouraged her to think about these real issues of landscape change and undertake coring. Um, now, coring basically is when we... We stick a long pole, an open vacuum pole, into the ground and we take a slice, effectively, um, of earth from the from the ground and we'd put that in a harbour that was probably once open that had now silted up so sediments have filled in and by, t- by taking out that chunk of sediment we can start to examine how the harbour had silted up by examining the nature, the colour, the texture, um, the small critters that once lived in the water that are now buried in the silt and the different layers of sediment um, that build up over time. We can then work out exactly how these landscapes have changed and how the harbour's filled up with silt. So the first time we did coring was in Sidon and then it inspired everyone in Lebanon and it started um, people and um, other archaeologists started coring in Beirut, Tyre and Byblos. And uh, the results, I mean, up to now, the publications are coming out for the results of the scoring. And it's really about the big picture. And I thought it was the most fascinating thing I've done, really, because it was really a bit outside my, my field work. You've really got to put your sites in context, haven't you? You've got to understand, as you say, that bigger landscape view and, and also how, how that, that the sort of link between land and sea has changed over time. So it's, 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 a, it's a big interconnected picture, really. It's just a, a column of earth and you would think, what is going, this going, going to give me? But then you realise when you get used to, it, to doing it is that is it, is it either it's a harbour silt or it's not. And this is how you determined what you're looking at. I think it was, I thought it was an inc- incredible experience. Not only was Anna Frost ahead of her time in, in sort of analysing silted harbours, but she also recognised the significance of rising sea levels and the impact they had on ancient sites as much as they do present a real threat to coastal heritage today. She identified how dramatic the impact of sea level rise was after the melting of the ice caps at the peak of the last ice age. So gradually we see rising sea levels inundating coastal landscapes, some of which had been occupied by ancient civilizations. She also was able to think about what were the indicators of these changes and she did a lot of work looking at coastlines, particularly in Lebanon, to see how we could interpret events of past coastal change. Lucy, I know that people really love the idea of kind of mysterious lost cities, but in fact, when it comes to underwater archaeology, entire ancient cities can be lost and then rediscovered and then investigated. I mean, if you think about the the story of the lost city, the lost world of Atlantis, I think that's a myth that has kernels of historical 
reality because we know there was massive geoseismic activity um, in the Bronze Age and that if you look at, I personally think it's 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 probably telling the story of the destruction of the volcano island of Thera and the civilization that was preserved there. But you do get all these phenomena. So you get rising sea levels, massive tectonic activity, siltation and climate change. And, and quite often, coastal settlements in the past have become immersed beneath the waves they have been literally swallowed by the sea like all of those myths i think this is the whole point it's not just shipwrecks that end up beneath the waves and we really need to tune in to all of those phenomena as you say i mean critically nowadays climate change is having a massive impact on on our coastal landscapes and our coastal heritage but these were not just things they're not just things of today they were very much things of the past as you indicate and all the sort of ramifications of tectonic movement, of big coastal inundations, big storm events. These were things that we know not just from the archaeological evidence, but also from um, ancient historians and, and ancient authors impacted on coastlines in the past. And therefore, they need to be part of the way we're thinking through today. In order to explore this a bit further, I'm going to ask Dr Nick Fleming, a marine geoarchaeologist from the University of Southampton, to tell us a bit more about how and why sea levels have changed over time and how this impacted on archaeological sites in the coastal zone. The control of global sea level by the melting and freezing of the continental ice caps has been understood in principle since the early 19th century. But only since the 1970s have we had the evidence from deep ocean sediment cores, which combined with radioactive dating methods, are giving a longer time scale than carbon-14, that show about five successive ice ages in the last million years. Each ice age, when the ice was piled up on the continents, caused the sea level to drop by about 130 metres, at the peak of each glaciation. Then when the ice melts again, the sea level would rise back to something like the present, and these periods are called interglacials. Now, it's really important what Nick's saying, because in order to detect sites that are now being submerged, we need to understand the processes that actually cause their submergence. I mean, let's think about sea level rise. We know at the peak of the last ice age, some 20,000 years ago, the sea levels were some 120, 130 metres lower than they are today. And so in the course of the last 20,000 years, as climate change and temperatures rose, um, the, the ice started to melt and the sea started to rise. And so this had a massive impact on coastal sites, particularly in the prehistoric era. So far, diving archaeologists have found about 2,000 submerged prehistoric sites under the European coastal seas, and several hundred more have been found by researchers in other parts of the world. One site of the Peloponnese coastline in Greece reveals how a fragile coastal settlement is preserved in just a few metres of water. I have known Dr John Henderson since we did our doctoral research together back in the 1990s and John is here to tell us about his research in coastal Greece. Well, we've been working in uh, Pavlopetri in Greece. It's in the southern part of the Peloponnese. Um, And, yeah, it's one of the oldest submerged towns in the world, um, dating to about 5,000 years ago. Um, Well, it began, ran from about 5,000 to 3,000 years ago, so right across the whole of the Greek Bronze Age. And it's basically one of the most exciting submerged sites in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, You've got a whole network of courtyards and streets and uh, graves across an area of about eight football fields underwater. Um, And it's just the most spectacular site. Wow. So what sort of depth are we talking about? Well, this is the good bit. For me, it's only in a depth of about three metres. Most of the site's in a depth from about three to about four metres deep which means I get to wear all the underwater kit and put the wetsuit on and look really cool. But if anything gets really dangerous, I can just stand up. Three metres? Hmm. I think you're going to have to kick a little bit, aren't you? (laughs) Just a bit, just a bit, yeah. But it's a beautiful sight. And actually, one of the best ways to see it is to snorkel over it Um, because it's crystal clear water. 
and you've got these limestone walls which are just sitting uh, just slightly proud of the sand and once you notice it with your eye you start following these walls underwater and realize there's a whole network of streets and you know rooms and courtyards and graves and just just an amazing sight um, the sad thing about it or the, the kind of one of the exciting things about it is the seas basically slowly eroding it away it's basically slowly excavating the site um, which means every time you go there you basically see something new and what was exciting for us is we started this project in 2009 so over a decade ago now um, and it was building on work that Nick Fleming had done back in 1968 um, and when they went out there originally with the Cambridge University team, they found, uh, you know, they found the remains of the Bronze Age town. And it was about 500 square metres of remains that they found. When we went in the water in 2009, the first thing we did was discover another 400 square metres of remains that had just been uncovered. Um, and that was just amazing. That was spectacular for me as an archaeologist to suddenly, you know, find major new bits of Bronze Age masonry and buildings and, you know, and pottery and all the rest of it. And that was the very first day that we dived on the site. Um, and I have to say, every single time you dive on it, there's something new. And again, that's because it's an active environment. It's because the sea is constantly excavating away. Exciting for archaeologists, but obviously also a problem in that there's, you know, this is going on all the time. The site is actually now in a worse condition than it was 10 years ago because it's being destroyed by the sea. So there's a real imperative to record what's there uh, before it's lost forever. Mm, no, that's really worrying. So how are you doing the recording? How are you mapping the site? We did, uh, um, you know, set to scan sonar, side scan sonar, you know, acoustic techniques. We also developed um, the early versions of, of photogrammetry, which is now very much an established technique in underwater archaeology. Um, but in 2009, we were right at the cutting edge of beginning to develop ways of, you know, using stereo photogrammetric photos to create 3D models of what was underwater. And that was really exciting because we really felt like we were sort of pushing the boundaries there. So my initial interest was, was throwing all these techniques at it with the ultimate dream of, of creating a 3D model of the site so that we could show it to people. Because, I mean, again, you know this, one of the big problems with underwater archaeology is most people can't see it, have never seen it, and probably never will see it, um, because they don't dive. And that's a very small percentage of the population. I think it's 0.01%, something like that. Um, so really, we need to be able to create photorealistic, you know, exciting images of what's underwater and give people part of the thrill of what's there. And we're going back to the Phoenician shipwreck that we've been tracking in Dive and Dig. Yeah, and we're going to speak to Timmy Gambin from the University of Malta, who is directing the Phoenician shipwreck project. Now, for the precise date of the Malta shipwreck, Tim and his team need more information and also means of dating the artefacts. So he's with us now. Um, Timmy, hi. Nice to nice to be, have the chance to speak to you again. Um, Thanks for having me back. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. We can't get enough of you, Timmy. Um, can, can you just tell me, with what you're finding, where do you think the origins of the objects are? The first thing we did was we looked for, we searched for parallels. So are there any similar objects elsewhere in the immediate area, mainly Sicily, Tunisia, um, and, and, and Sardinia? In order to find out exactly where this particular amphora, this, this particular amphora being carried on the shipwreck was made, I needed to knock on the door of my colleague, Dr. Maxime Anastasi. What Dr. Anastasi does is she specializes in the identification of clay. So amphoras are made from clay. The clay in Malta is different to the clay in Sicily, different to the clay in Tunisia, and so on. So we sample the ceramic objects. We have these uh, processed into what we call thin sections. She looks at them together with an Italian colleague under, under a microscope and is able to identify where the clay is from. So in this particular, from this particular shipwreck, we have objects that are made in Tunis and objects that are definitely made on Malta and Gozo. This is hugely important for us because it tells us that the ship was not just here by accident, pushed by rogue winds and pushed and wrecked off, uh, off, off Malta, but this ship had actually stopped locally probably unloaded uh, material and loaded loaded produce. So we're starting to 
put together the puzzle of where the objects on board the ship are from. In 2018, we came across the first traces of timber, of wood. We uh, sent a sample to a laboratory in Poznan in Poland. And when the date came back, we were pleasantly surprised. The date range has now been narrowed to from 730 to 700 BC. So it's slightly older than we thought initially. Um, and we have a span of, uh, of, of, of 30 years within which our ship could have been built, utilized, and then eventually lost. Analysis is, tele is, is, is also helping us understand the role of these islands of Malta and Gozo within the broader Phoenician uh, network uh, during the Archaic period. Remarkable, a, a genuinely sophisticated system. Um, so Timmy's opened our eyes uh, this week to what Phoenicians were carrying on board, where some of it came from and when he thinks that ship was sailing. But in the next episode, we're going to be given access to more clues about the precise analysis of the cargo and discover just how archaeologists date finds and then conserve material recovered from the deep. Join us in the next episode of this podcast for more on how modern technology has revolutionised maritime archaeology. This podcast was brought to you by the Honor Frost Foundation, a charitable foundation that promotes maritime archaeological research in the eastern Mediterranean. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>